Seth Rollins' WWE contract is reportedly set to expire in 2024. Plus, ahead of seemingly them feuding in WWE on Monday Night Raw, Seth Rollins has once again taken a shot at CM Punk during a recent WWE live event. Is AEW profitable? That's a big question we're going to discuss today, in addition to more details about how much revenue All Elite Wrestling is pulling in in 2023. WWE and Major League Wrestling MLW reportedly have reached a settlement in their antitrust lawsuit. New Japan Pro Wrestling announces they're going to be bringing in the IWGP Global Championship at Wrestle Kingdom next month. A more backstage reaction to the firing of former AWVP Kevin Sullivan and Andrade Al Idolo CML Al return match and date is confirmed. Hey guys, welcome back to Wrestling News 365. Hope everyone is doing very well. As always, there are plenty of news stories to get into in the world of professional wrestling. Let's start off with the big developing news this evening, and that is that the current World Heavyweight Champion in WWE, Seth Freakin' Rollins, his contract with the company is reportedly set to expire next year. The free agent class of 2024 might be the biggest in recent memory. The likes of Drew McIntyre, Becky Lynch, Alex Hammerstone, QT Marshall, Dustin Rhodes, Deanna Perrazzo, and others have all been confirmed as having deals coming up next year in 2024. Well, there's another big name that currently has a deal set to expire in 2024, that being the World Heavyweight Champion Seth Rollins. Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful is reporting this evening that Fightful have learned that Rollins' contract is up in June of 2024. And as a couple of weeks ago, there hasn't been any discussions regarding a contract extension. As you can imagine, by his placement on the card, Rollins is well-liked and respected within the company. And Fightful have been told there will, quote, obviously be an offer made at some point, with WWE sources even indicating that he'd be made a priority. When asking a WWE official, Fightful have been told, quote, we would not dispute that information, end quote, as it pertains to his contract being up next year and that Rollins would be made a priority with the company. WWE signed numerous talent to new deals back in 2019, five-year contracts when All Elite Wrestling launched, locking in numerous into long-term five-year deals that are up next year in 2024. Now, Fightful do say they're not sure if Rollins was among the talent that signed new contracts back in 2019. Fightful did reach out to Rollins but have not heard back. Of course, as things stand, interestingly, the husband and wife pair of Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch, their deals with the WWE are both up in June of next next year. What are your thoughts when it comes to Seth Rollins, his future with WWE? Do you think there's any chance Rollins could leave the company? Do you expect him to stay with the company? He's a company guy. He's spoken on record several times about being a company guy. He's also the world heavyweight champion. Do you think the outcome of his feud with CM Punk could be an indication as to where he wants to go and what he wants to do with his career? Could his current back injury play a factor as well? Let me know your thoughts about that in the comment section below. Now, since we're talking about Seth Rollins as well, and this feud that's seemingly on the horizon with the recently returned CM Punk. Rollins has taken another shot at the former AEW World Champion over the weekend, this time at a WWE house show in Utica, New York. The WWE World Heavyweight Champion's comments came while he addressed those in attendance who were chanting Punk's name. Here's what actually Seth Rollins had to say and his latest swipe at his future rival. Last time we were in this building. 
Now, Rollins and CM Punk, of course, look to be on a collision course in the near future after Punk's recent return to WWE. Although not shown on WWE programming, Rollins was caught recently reacting negatively to Punk's surprise return at the end of Survivor Series last month in Chicago. Rollins had previously expressed his disdain and dislike for Punk, even referring to him as a cancer during an interview previously. Since Survivor Series, Punk, who was fired by All Elite Wrestling with cause in September following a backstage altercation with Jack Perry All In, has made subtle references to Rollins on television, while the champ shot at the best in the world have been delivered at non-televised events via media interviews as well. Of course, tonight, CM Punk is at Monday Night Raw in Cleveland, Ohio, and it's speculated that he may sign with the brand. He's going to sign with either Raw, SmackDown, or NXT this evening. Could we see the first face-to-face -face between Punk and Rollins tonight on Raw? Let me know your predictions about that as well. Now, is AEW profitable? That's a massive question that so many people have wondered really since the inception of the company back in 2019. Well, there's the latest update when it comes to AEW's revenue prediction for this year, as well as if the company is profitable. Now, this comes from uh, Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics, and he has written, for 2023, he estimates that All Elite Wrestling will generate about $154 million in net revenue, an increase from $100 million estimated for 2022. In the company's fourth full calendar year, the business is likely still not profitable, according to Thurston, but a strong increase in U.S. media rights fees, presumably currently being negotiated with Warner Brothers Discovery, WBD, could make the company profitable on an annual basis as early as 2025. Now, he has gone into a lot of detail regarding the different facets of the revenue for All Elite Rest, and we're going to do really top-line stuff here. In a future video, we'll break this down really in further detail because I think it's a really fascinating topic. Now, when he goes into the television deal, which is really the bulk of AEW's finances here, AEW's media business, which includes revenue from weekly television broadcasts and pay-per-view, likely makes up around 60% of total revenue, which Thurston estimate, estimates as around $98 million. Of course, the most important partner is its US TV distributor, WBD, uh, parents of platforms including TNT, TBS, Bleach Report, and Max. Now, AEW CEO Tony Khan in the past has disclosed the value of AEW's TV deal with Warner Bros. Discovery, agreed to in 2020 before the introduction of Collision, was worth $175 million over four years, with an option of a fifth year, which has presumably been executed for 2024, which indicates an average annual value of $44 million. Now, some of that revenue is driven by sharing ads with the TV networks that broadcast AEW weekly programs, but Thurston believes the majority of the compensation is guaranteed. Such deals normally have annual escalators and increasing fees paid to the content provider each year without accounting for the launch of Collision in June and only accounting for Dynamite, Rampage, Battle of the Bouts and other shoulder programming, Thurston estimates annual compensation towards AEW's US TV deal to be about $50 million in 2023 as the company is in its final non-option year of the term that probably does have escalating fees as well. Now, he estimated any given taping of Dynamite or Collision costs about $650,000 per episode to produce. According to Khan, at a press conference in May, WBD is paying AEW more since Collision was added at an additional weekly touring event. At a minimum, it's believed by Thurston that WBD is compensating AEW enough to allow the wrestling company to cover substantial costs from the added weekly live events. Therefore, he is estimate estimating incremental media revenue related to Collision at a about $34 million on an annualized basis prorated for 2023 to $18 million as there will be just 27 episodes for this year that the show because the show debuted in June. That brings the estimated US TV revenue to about $68 million for the year as well. When it comes to pay-per-view, it seems likely AEW will reach around 1 million pay-per-view buys for the year over eight events. Now, Thurston believes that total worldwide buys across all platforms have ranged between 90 and 190,000 with buys for some events later in the year selling slightly less than events earlier in the year as fan interest in the company has declined. 
for this segment as well as the estimate overall. He's excluding any business related to Ring of Honor, as Tony Khan is insisting that they're separate companies. The assumption is that domestic pay-per-view buys make up around 65% of all buys, sold at $50 price point with an average split to AEW of 45%, with a lower average price point for international buys and a slightly lower split. Under those assumptions, the pay-per-view business has generated $19.4 million in revenue for AEW of the year. Now, when it comes to live events, it's been estimated that AEW will generate around $34 million in ticket sales for the year from just over 500,000 ticket sales, including estimates for events in December that haven't yet taken place. For gates for other pay-per-view events, they either have claims from Khan or Polestar data. He has accounted for Revolution as an $800,000 gate, Double or Nothing as a $964,000 gate, Forbidden Door as a $1.2 million gate, All Out as an $800,000 gate, Wrestle Dream as $533,000, Full Gear as $900,000, and it's assumed World's End at the end of this month will be $850,000. Other ticket sales volumes based on the assumption that about 90% of estimated tickets distributed from Wrestle Ticks analysis represent actual ticket sales. It's been estimated average ticket sold prices by event type derived from results of public records and Polestar data. For AW's biggest event, All In, the company claimed a $10 million gate from 81,035 ticket sales. Now, once you get into things like merch sales and stuff like that, it's a bit more difficult. It's a bit more difficult to kind of figure out. So, again, we'll leave that for a future video, but sort of top line, it's speculated that possibly you could see a situation whereby venue merchandise is maybe around sort of $6 million in terms of revenue. Online merchandise sales is around $4.7 million as well. But certainly if you're going to do nearest comparisons or anything like that, WWE reported $1.3 billion with a B uh, dollars in the 12 months from October 1st, 2022 to September 30, 2023. That's more than eight times the estimated revenue for AEW, which is $154 million estimated. New Japan almost certainly has the third highest revenue among wrestling companies globally. For the 12 months ending June 30, 2023, New Japan recorded $36.2 million in revenue, $154 million for AEW from January to December. It's just over four times that. So certainly you've got AEW making more money in terms of net revenue than New Japan, but significantly less than WWE. Now, Brandon Thurston has tried to get into expenses and things like that. Again, we'll do that at a future rate and in a future video. But certainly, as of right now, uh, the assumption is that as of right now, AEW is not profitable. However, if they were able to get a media rights fees that really doubled the fees they're current, get, currently getting, it could make this AEW business model sustainable beginning as soon as 2025. So what are your thoughts on that kind of information there? Is that kind of par for the course when it comes to any new company? Of course, they do say that companies for the first several years of their life cycle uh, operate at a loss and eventually build up to a profit. Would that be good that possibly by 2025, that six years after All Elite Wrestling was founded, they could then be operating at a profit? Is that positive or does it concern you that they're still operating at a loss and how big is that loss? Let me know your thoughts, your predictions on all of it in the comment section below. Now, let's go back to WWE and a big story that's been bubbling along for quite some time, and that's this antitrust lawsuit between WWE and MLW. Well, MLW's antitrust lawsuit against WWE appears to have been settled. According to documents obtained by Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics once again, lawyers for MLW and WWE submitted a, quote, notice of settlement to the courts on Monday. The final settlement documents are expected to be filed within the next 30 days. It says, quote, in accordance accordance with the court's standing order for civil cases, section, um, section 4, F1, Plaintiff, MLW Media, and Defendant, World Wrestling Entertainment, hereby submit this notice of settlement to notify the court that the parties have settled this action. The parties are in the process of completing the final settlement documents and expect to file the appropriate dismissal papers within the next 30 days. Um, this is what Dave Meltz posted to social media. He said, quote, the parties are in the process of completing the documentation and they expect the actual settlement to close in the next 30 days. The MLW's uh, lawyers filed the document today. There have had been discussions regarding a settlement dating back some time, as Dave Meltz posted. No terms were announced. If um, major, as in other settlements, TKO would likely announce them in the next few days in an SEC filing. It won't uh, likely be the next few days, but more likely after completed settlement 
settlement is done. When WWE has settled other cases, they issue an SEC filing. Most likely, complete terms will be sealed, though, although basics could be released. Now, for a bit of background on this uh, lawsuit, MLW first filed its antitrust suit against WWE in January of 2022. It's alleged WWE put pressure on third parties, such as streaming service Tubi TV, to abandon relationships with MLW. The lawsuit is alleged WWE put pressure on Vice TV to stop working with MLW as well. So that one looks to be settled. Of course, we get any more details on the settlement in the future days and weeks. We'll let you know. Now, a lot of people have been wondering what's going to be going on with the IWGP, US, UK, Intercontinental, all of those titles. What's happening? Now we have the answer and we're going to have a new champion at Wrestle Kingdom 18 for a new championship. The new championship belt being introduced by New Japan Pro Wrestling at Wrestle Kingdom 18 now has a name. During a press conference today, following the conclusion of this year's World Tag League Tournament, New Japan Chairman Naoki Sugabashi announced that the winner of the three-way match between Will Ospreay, John Moxley and David Finlay on January 4 will be crowned as the brand new IWGP Global Heavyweight Champion. The decision to create the new title came after Finlay destroyed both the New Japan uh, IWGP United States Heavyweight Championship and the IWGP United Kingdom Heavyweight Championship, a rebranded bout made by the then title holder Will Ospreay, uh, bout at Power Struggle last month. The introduction of the Global Heavyweight Championship also coincides with New Japan's aim to establish its presence in more countries next year. The company wants to grow, quote, throughout all of Europe and the rest of Asia and Oceania. New Japan has already attempted to make a larger mark in both the United Kingdom and the United States, hence the creation of the New Japan Strong brand in the US a few years ago. Notably, the Japanese organization had considered reviving the IWGP Intercontinental Championship, which was retired in March 2021 for the upcoming Wrestle Kingdom event. However, given New Japan's mission for more global reach, it was agreed that the Global Heavyweight Championship name was most fitting of the current plans and direction. What are your thoughts on the Global Heavyweight Championship? Did you want to see the Intercontinental Championship come back? Are you interested to see what the title looks like? And who do you think the first champion is going to be, given the fact that Will Ospreay is headed to All Elite Wrestling, leaving New Japan? John Moxley is an AEW contracted talent that occasionally appears on New Japan shows. Is it going to go to David Finley, arguably the person that people want in the match the least? Let me know your thoughts about that as well. Now, we've got some more reaction when it comes to the recent firing, shocking firing, of former VP of post-production Kevin Sullivan in AEW. Last week, it emerged that AEW's senior vice president and co-executive producer Mike Mansry had fired VP of post-production Kevin Sullivan. Sullivan, not to be confused with the former wrestler by the same name, initially joined the promotion from Impact Wrestling when it first began operations in 2019. He was a day one guy. According to longtime wrestling reporter Dave Meltzer, he was speaking about the decision on the rest Observer radio show, Sullivan's firing has been met with a, quote, unanimous negative reaction behind the curtain. He added that Sullivan was popular among talent and production staff as well. People who work for Tony Khan's promotion believe that Sullivan was, quote, the best at doing his job, which included creating video package, uh, packages and vignettes, as well as piecing together content for YouTube. Meltzer noted last week that Sullivan was responsible for building AEW's entire post-production team. The reason why Sullivan was fired has yet to be disclosed, although AEW co-owner and CEO Khan did not overrule the call to let him go. However, Sullivan was allegedly told that AEW was going in a different direction, which is consistent with QT Marshall's decision to leave the promotion as well. Marshall, who works as an on-screen talent and also wears many hats behind the scenes, mentioned that the company has changed a lot since 2019 and is heading in a different direction when he announced on social media that he was departing AEW at the end of the year after handing in his his resignation. According to reports, AEW is going to start prioritizing in-ring competition, similar to how New Japan Pro Wrestling does story, does their stories, uh, having in-ring action over storylines and angles. Again, that's according to recent reports. Finally, Andrade Al Idola, of course, he's set to return to CMLL, and more details surrounding his return to the promotion have now been confirmed. Of course, it was an outstanding week for AEW star Andrade Al Idolo. On Saturday, he put himself in a three-way tie atop the Gold League and the AEW Continental Classic, facing off against Brian Danielson. But just as significantly, the night before, Andrade confirmed reports that he will return to the place where he began his career. 
Friday night, it was announced via video by CM Ow Ow that Andrade would be returning to the promotion. The video was quickly posted to social media, and the following day on X, CM Ow Ow announced Andrade's return match to the promotion will take place at Super Vern's this Friday, where he's teaming up with two stars to take on another three stars in trios competition. This will be the first time Andrade has stepped into CM Ow Ow's home base, Arena Mexico, in eight years after he left the promotion to sign with WWE. During his time in CM Ow Ow, Andrade worked under the name La Sombra, which he and CM Ow Ow referenced in his announcement, and was best known for forming the group Los Ingobernables alongside fellow AEW star Roosh. The group would later grow in to include former WWE star Mark Jindrak and New Japan star Tetsuya Naito who would later create the popular offshoot stable Los Ingobernables de Japan. Andrade's appearance in CM Ow Ow is another signal of the growing relationship between All Elite Wrestling and CM Ow Ow, which began working together in October after AEW booked Mystico for an episode of AEW Rampage. With Andrade now tied back to CM Ow Ow, it may also open the door for him to work New Japan events, which he had previously been barred from due to working dates of CM Ow Ow's rival promotion, Lucha Libre AAA, in 2021 and 2022. So there you go, guys. This latest pro wrestling news for you. Be sure to smash the like and the like button. Be sure to subscribe, bottom right-hand corner. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, and I'll speak to you again very, very soon. Hey guys, thank you for watching, listening, streaming, or however you come across this video today. Be sure to click on the video on the right there to watch our next video, or click the bottom there to subscribe, or the bottom right-hand corner. Thank you very much, and I'll speak to you again very soon.